My Inuk name is Ningyu Kurluk, and Prime Minister, it means bossy little old lady. Tonight, a historic day for Canada as the country's first Indigenous Governor General is sworn in. She's a strong Inuk woman. She's a very strong Canadian, uh, and she has accomplished so much. What the swearing in of an Inuk woman as Governor General means for Indigenous people and Inuit in particular. And pen to paper on a deal decades in the making for a community grappling with the long term effects of mercury poisoning. Good evening, welcome to APTN National News. I'm Daryl Stranger. Canada's 30th Governor General is officially sworn in. Mary Simon is the country's first ever Indigenous Governor General, and in order to properly mark the occasion, Ottawa pulled out the stops to indigenize the ceremony. Our Lindsay Richardson was there. By the light of an Inuit kulik and the beat of an Anishinaabe drumming circle, Mary Simon of Kujuak, Quebec, was officially sworn into office as yeah, Governor Canada. General. Her Excellency, the Right Honourable Mary May Simon. It's a history-making move, and for Simon, an opportunity to make an official introduction. Today is an important and historic day for Canada, but my story to these chambers began very far from here. I was born Jeannie, Mary Jeannie May in Arctic Quebec, now known as Nunavik. My Inuk name is Ningyu Kurluk, and Prime Minister, it means bossy little old lady. <laughs> Swearing in of a Governor General is Canada's oldest continuing tradition. There was typical fare, like the presentation of the callers of office, the inspection of the Royal Guard, and the firing of a 21-gun salute. But Monday was in many ways a day of firsts. The first opened by an Inuk performer. It was also the first time a Governor General opened her inaugural speech in Inuktitut. Simon has had a storied political career so far, but her experience as an Inuk woman raised in Quebec is what she feels set the stage for this career-defining moment. What I value most about my upbringing was my parents teaching my siblings and I how to live in two worlds, the Inuit world and the non-Inuit southern world. This foundation of core, of core values has both served and shaped me throughout my life, and I believe helped me get to the important turning point as a young girl when I stopped being afraid. It took time before I gained the self-confidence to assert myself and my beliefs in the non-Indigenous world. But when I came to understand that my voice had power and that others were looking to me to be their wo voice, I was able to let go of my fear. Mary Simon's appointment as Governor General is historic, but not unanimously accepted. She doesn't speak French, and Canada's official language's watchdog has received hundreds of complaints to that effect. They are promising an investigation, and Simon, in turn, is promising to put in the work towards proficiency. En tant que Governor General, je m'engage à respecter les normes éthiques les plus, é, plus élevées. Sometimes I have a little trouble pronouncing, but I'm learning. Simon will work with a tutor at Rideau Hall to improve her grasp of the language. Despite the opposition, the Prime Minister feels Simon will be Canada's key player when it comes to building bridges between nations. Your Excellency. You remind us that true leadership is not measured in the honours or distinctions stacked up behind someone's name, although today you take on yet another title among many. Rather, true leadership is measured in what you do for those around you. It is measured in an ability to reach out and build a brighter future for all, not just for a lucky few. 
Mary Simon lists climate change, mental health services, and the continued searches of residential school sites among her priorities for when Parliament resumes in the fall. However, it's strongly rumored her first act as Governor General will be to dissolve Parliament so that a federal election can be called sometime this August. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Ottawa. Leaders of national indigenous organizations had a front row seat at the Governor General installation. APTN's Brett Forrester caught up with a few of them after the ceremony. Natan Obed felt a rush of pride as he watched Mary Simon take yep, the Governor General's oath that of office. I was so proud, uh, not just for Inuit, but also for First Nations and Métis as well, and all Canadians. But Obed is the president of the Inuit Taparit Kanatami, a position Simon held twice in the early 2000s. He worries the expectations placed on her as the first indigenous head of a colonial state may be too high. But he thinks the veteran diplomat, administrator and politician Absolutely is up to the task. As somebody who's gone through the constitutional repatriation talks, who's been an Enoch leader for the better part of 40 years, uh, she understands to her core the way in which Canada has um, abused human rights, has, has been a colonial institution. David Chartrand reacted the same way as he watched the new Governor General emerge from the Senate. Oh, pride. Uh, I had a chance to tell Mary how proud the Métis Nation is of, of her appointment. Chartrand, Vice President for the Métis National Council, praised the appointment and had a message for those criticizing her inability to speak French. What if we told you, you don't speak our Indigenous language, you can't come to our country, how would you feel? We, so I think people should give her the time and she will learn French without doubt. It's just, uh, but in, uh, Indigenous language are before French and English in this country. So. Obed called the criticisms disheartening because Simon attended a federal day school in northern Quebec that didn't offer education in French. But for Obed and many others, today was one of hope and optimism. AFN National Chief Roseanne Archibald was in attendance but wasn't available for comment prior to broadcast. Brett Forrester, APTN National News, Ottawa. Mary Simon may be from Quebec's northern Nunavik region, but Inuit all over Canada were celebrating. That includes Nunavut, where our Kent Driscoll shows you, according to one language advocate, you can already see the, see the Simon effect on language. This from Iqaluit. Mary Simon's installation as Governor General was a big step for one Inuit, but it's being praised by Inuit all over Canada. Here in Nunavut, promotion of Inuit language is a priority. Carlene Ariak is the Nunavut Language Commissioner, and she was thrilled. I was overly ecstatic. I was so excited to watch the whole thing today with the Governor General. I'm so immensely proud of her. Uh, not only for the fact that she's a strong Inuk woman, she's a very strong Canadian, uh, and she has accomplished so much uh, within her lifetime. Ariak has been around Inuit politics most of her life. Her mother, Eva Ariak, is former language commissioner, former premier, and current commissioner of Nunavut. Mary Simon has been on her radar a long time. Uh, when I was growing up, she's always been in the public life since I was growing up. And uh, there became a point where I even asked a family member if we're related to her because she's so relatable and approachable. Uh, and that's just the character of who she is. Check out the Atigi Ariak is wearing. That isn't a Nunavut design. That's a Nunavik design. She wore it in tribute of a Nunavik Inuk being chosen Governor General. She also thinks the exposure Inuktitut is receiving here can help Inuit long term. She spoke in Inuktitut first. She's very proud of her language. Uh, and we even saw in the media coverage of having, uh, I believe, eight additional indigenous languages that were broadcasted today, including in the Inuit language. Uh, so she's already shone a, a brighter light on um, not only the Inuit language, but indigenous languages. Simon faced criticism for not speaking French. In her role as language commissioner, Ariak is responsible for all three of Nunavut's official languages. English, French, and Inuktut, which covers both Inuktitut and the Inuinoctun spoken in western Nunavut. She thinks she learned something from the French-speaking complaints about Simon. 
I wanted to take it as an opportunity for Nunavut to know that they do have these language rights in Nunavut and they can receive services in the language of their choice and if people don't feel that their language rights have been respected they can certainly come to our office and we can ensure that their language rights are being respected. So learning from the French language community that's how many people were passionate enough to say, hey, my language rights are not being respected. Nunavut also has this right. Mary Simon hasn't announced when she will visit Nunavut, but she most likely will. Most of her predecessors did, including Mikhail Jean and Julie Payette. When it does happen, the difference? The Queen's representative will be speaking in Nuktitut. And in Nunavut, that means something. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Akalawit. We want to hear what you think about Mary Simon officially becoming the first Indigenous Governor General. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca or leave a comment on aptnnews.ca. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and now TikTok. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. We have to take a short break, but still ahead, the Yukon government has announced plans for a supervised safe consumption site. Welcome back. The federal government announced Friday that they'll soon be taking proposals to help build shelters and housing for Indigenous people facing gender-based violence. Josh Grummet has more. Speaking in Iqaluit, Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller announced that applications would soon be open to build shelters and housing for Indigenous people across Canada who are facing gender-based violence. Miller did not announce new funding Friday. Instead, he pointed to the Liberals' 2021 budget, which includes... A $725 million investment by the government of Canada that includes $420 million for at least 38 Indigenous-led emergency shelters and at least 50 Indigenous-led transition homes across Canada. Some of the funding is already earmarked for operations. This includes an investment of $304 million over five years and a further $96.6 million ongoing for the operation of those new shelters as well as transitional houses across the country, including in the north, particularly in the north, given the issues that have been raised, as well as in urban areas. The announcement comes after a crisis of domestic violence earlier this year in Quebec, where 10 women were murdered in 10 weeks, two of them Inuit. Per APTN's Lindsay Richardson, there are currently only three women's shelters serving 14 remote flying communities in Quebec's northern Nunavik region and 70% of Inuit communities across Canada are currently without access to the shelters and housing needed to help people facing gender-based violence. Ahmed Hussein is the Federal Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. We know this is key to Indigenous women and children uh, and, and, and Indigenous communities to be able to reclaim their power and place in their communities in Canada. He said that even though the funding is national in scope, Nunavut will not be forgotten. Well, the, uh, the, the, the call for proposals will reflect, uh, and, and the funding will reflect the need across um, uh, a number of communities, and obviously Nunavut will be, will be a big part of that. Applications for the funding open in September. Josh Grummet, APTN National News, Winnipeg. As a way to tackle the Yukon's growing opioid crisis, the territorial government has announced plans are underway for a supervised safe consumption site. The facility will be the first supervised safe consumption site in the territory as well as in the north. It will be located in a residential area of downtown Whitehorse. There's no word yet on when it will open, but the government says the site will hopefully prevent overdoses and deaths. And so they'll be able to consume their substances um, and then have a, a sort of a supported, I guess for lack of a better term, a chill out area, just to make sure that uh, after they've consumed, there are no harmful effects that we see, such as the overdoses um, and overdose related deaths and other harms. And Grassy Narrows First Nation will have more resources to handle a decades old mercury problem in their community. Approximately 90% of residents there suffer from mercury poisoning after the Dryden Chemical Company dumped tons of the toxin into the English 
Wabagoon River uncontrolled for seven years. The release killed the lucrative fishing industry and sickened the community. Our Michelle Karlenzig was there for Minister Mark Miller's announcement of federal help. I'm here in Grassy Narrows, Ontario, where the waters of this First Nation community were poisoned by mercury in the 1960s. The community has been grappling with the effects of mercury poisoning, including tremors, paralysis, and even early death. The effects have touched every generation, but today the federal government has announced $69.8 million in funding that will go towards the Mercury Care Home, a facility that will help people living with the effects of mercury poisoning. Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller has arrived from Ottawa, and I'll have more on what this funding means for the community and how they feel about it. Wildfires continue to rage across half, the, half of the country. The situation is most serious in British Columbia, where more than 250 fires are currently burning. But CTV's Jill McEshawn tells us some badly needed help has arrived for crews who have been battling fires for weeks now. In BC's southern interior, a little bit of good news. In a Soyuz at a local First Nation, some evacuation orders were lifted, allowing dozens to return home. But up and down the Okanagan Valley, thousands are still out. International help arrived. I just had the opportunity and pleasure to welcome to British Columbia 100 firefighters who are joining us from Mexico. In 100 Mile House, where fires are burning south and east of town, people have been on evacuation alert for weeks now. The mayor appreciative the province is working to bring in more help, but he knows it's limited. Half of Canada is on fire, half of the United States is on fire. That's where we potentially get most of our firefighters from, and that's just not available anymore. Across the West, every province is in this fight, with new fires reported this weekend in Alberta and Manitoba, where five First Nations have been evacuated. Three fires came together and they created one big massive fire. More than 2,000 people are now out of their homes. Most evacuees have come to Winnipeg, where large families are living in small hotel rooms. We don't know when we're going to go home, and that's uh, so stressful for so many of us. Virginia Thomas and her family have been gathering donations to help. The children want to go home. They're so used to just stepping outside and going to play outside. And so that's why we're trying to provide so many uh, toys for them to keep them busy in the hotel rooms. Five Ontario First Nations have now been evacuated. 3,000 people have fled their homes in northwestern Ontario. I kind of felt the sadness because our home is a comfort zone. There is no timeline to return. The fires need to be contained before that can happen. This week in northwestern Ontario and eastern Manitoba, rain is in the forecast. The question is, will it be enough to help? Jill McEshawn, CTV News, Winnipeg. We need to take one final break, but stick around. You won't want to miss today's photo of the day. It's quite the catch. Welcome back. It's time now for our photo of the day. This is Cornelius Linklater of Puckatawagan, Manitoba, and his prize-winning northern pike at 90.7 centimeters. He also won this brand-new hammerhead dune buggy thanks to the pike. Congratulations, Cornelius. Be sure to keep those photos coming along with the when, how, and where details by sending your photos to share at aptn.ca. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting in the east, 22 in rain in Charlottetown and 25 in Halifax. 15 in rain in Nain and 24 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. 22 in a mix of sun and cloud in Quebec City and 21 in Val d'Or. 25 in rain in Toronto and 21 in North Bay. 22 in rain in Timmins and 26 in sun in Big Trout Lake. 27 in sun in God's Lake and 27 in Norway House. 33 in sunshine in Winnipeg and 35 in Brandon. 35 in sun in Regina and 28 in rain in North Battleford. 21 in rain in Stony Rapids and 25 in La Ronge. In the west, 25 in sun in Grand Prairie and 22 in high level. A mix of sun and cloud and 26 in Calgary and 26 in Edmonton. 27 in sunshine in Campbell River and 25 in sun in Quesnel. 19 in a mix of sun and cloud in Dees Lake and 21 in Smithers. 
22 degrees in Dawson and 20 in Beaver Creek. 18 in Sun and Cloud and Yellowknife and 22 in Norman Wells. 16 in Cloudy and Colville Lake and 19 in Fort McPherson. 13 in a mix of Sun and Cloud and Baker Lake and 19 in Arviat. 9 degrees in Sunshine and Clyde River and 11 in Iqaluit. This summer marks 100 years since the last numbered treaty in Canada was signed. Communities from across the Sawtooth region of the Northwest Territories are gathering to commemorate. This week, our reporter Charlotte Moore Jacobs takes us to the small communities of Delaney and Toledo for a look at the legacy of Treaty 11. Here's part one of that series. Delaney Northwest Territories, home to roughly 500 Sawtooth Dene. In the old days, they would go down. They would they would have bundles and bundles of dry fish uh, to uh, sell and uh, trade with. Uh, and around Great Bear Lake, they've practiced their culture on the land and water. So folks like Sire Yukon with the Delaney Gotne government have been hard at work organizing and participating in on-the-land trips. The goal was to get people more engaged on the land like our ancestors used to. Yeah, and to teach them about our culture. So every year since we started, we plan on going to different locations to learn about the different areas around the lake. Delaney is marking the 100th anniversary of the signing of Treaty 11 by sending 40 paddlers on the Great Bear River from Delaney to Toledo, where Treaty was signed to celebrate our rights as like indigenous people. And so this year we wanted to join in with the canoes to kind of support that, you know, and especially on the canoes because it kind of comes from like our traditional travel, traditional ways of traveling back in the day. The trip is also about providing learning opportunities to the next generation. Like 16 year old Kata Neali, one of the youngest paddlers on the trip. I know it's something like freeing the ancestors. How did you feel when you were asked to do that? Uh, oh, kind of nervous because I usually, I don't really do stuff in a, a crowd. The legacy of Treaty 11 is complex. In the summer of 1921, Canada's colonial government sent a Treaty 11 party down the Mackenzie River, where they would stop in eight communities. The Dene were under the impression they signed an agreement for peace and friendship. In reality, it resulted in the dispossession of indigenous lands, as the Crown staked illegitimate claim over oil reserves and restrictions imposed on traditional harvest. A lot of people are already looking to Dene. In spite of this, Chief Leroy Andre says Delaney in 2021 is celebrating resiliency. My grandfather Andre was 19 years old when treaty was signed in Tulida. He said he was there, he witnessed everything, all the discussions that happened. So a hundred years have gone by since we signed Treaty 11. We also now signed a land claim agreement we signed a self-government agreement. So the last 100 years, you guys are representing Satut in a people, Delaney. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, Delaney. That's all we have for you on this Monday edition of APT National News. For more Indigenous news, you can visit our website at aptnnews.ca. I'm Daryl Stranger. Have a great night.